say is with uh, working class fighters like the sister and the brother who just spoke, I think our, uh, our future is brighter, uh, definitely brighter. So I want to speak a little bit about the, uh, the situation they're facing, maybe globally and then locally, and how it, how it comes together. Because I think uh, you know, if you look out around the world, we're seeing an incredible polarization that's taking place between the left, the right. We see the growth of the hard right in countries like Hungary and Austria, Poland, Spain, the Netherlands, the election of uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil. We see in the United States the uh, tragic attack on Jewish worshipers that just happened in California, and on Muslims in Christchurch, this horrified people everywhere by the depth of the anti-Semitism, the depth of the Islamophobia. We're seeing ongoing bigotry, anti-black racism, the recent provocation that just took place uh, of the LGBTQ community right here in the heart of the community at uh, Church in Wellesley just the other day. People going to particularly provoke a fight. They had cameras on them. They were trying to provoke violence. And it elicited a strong response, obviously, and a, a, a good response. Now, this has been accompanied also by intensifying attacks by neoliberal governments, corporations, which have been creating an incredible volatility. Fear, anxiety for the future is felt by so many. In my workplace today, a teacher walked in with a big button saying, class size does matter. She was proudly wearing it, but you know what? She's in the Dufferin Peel Catholic Board, and she just got her layoff notice, and she just got permanent. And she's saying, you know, my parents came here as Portuguese immigrants, they worked hard all their lives. They sent me to school. I thought I had a decent middle class job. And what is this man doing? This is the feeling that's going on. This is the feeling. And I think that uh, that future, that anxiety, is creating all kinds of volatility. And we're seeing in many, many places around the world that the parties of the center, the old parties, they're not drawing the support they garnered in the past. And many, many, many people are looking for alternatives. A friend of mine in France said, the Yellow Jackets are amazing. They are ordinary people, not amongst the poor, but just above, who are tired of the taxes, the end of which they never see. And all these families with two earners can't even buy presents for their children. They want the law that suppresses taxes for the very, very rich to be annulled, among other things. They hate Macron, his arrogance, his contempt for them. And when they started those weekend after weekend after weekend demonstrations, 84% of the French people supported them. And this speaks to the demand for something fundamentally different. You know, when we say things change when they can no longer stay the same, are we getting toward that tipping point? And it certainly feels that way, we'll have to see. No one has a crystal ball. But here in Ontario, the government was one, the majority was one, with only 40% of the vote. 60% of people who voted rejected the Tories' poorly defined platform, and they feared what was to come. And they certainly had seen the 60% Doug Ford's work as a city councilor in Toronto. His mean-spirited approach to municipal politics in league with his now deceased brother, Rob Ford, shows absolutely contempt for publicly funded services and alliances with the developers the wealthy. He had earlier lost a race to become mayor of this city, and it almost feels like he's a man with a grudge. Whatever is happening around the province, it's happening worse in this city. It's very interesting. And he's brought this neoliberal agenda to the province as a whole. And in less than a year, he's tried to change the face of Ontario. And as anyone who lives in this province knows, one of his first steps was to roll back the, fifth, the victory of the $15 minimum wage, which was to have come into effect January 1, 2019. His callous disregard for those who work at poverty wages, primarily women of color, have struggled along with so many others to fight for a better economic future for themselves and their families. It typifies his contempt for the working class and the poor and all the diversity that we see in this city. And unfortunately, it was just the start. The Ford government, as many of you know, is slashing hospital budgets, taking away access to post-secondary education for low-income students, 
laying off teachers, increasing class sizes, decimating public health, cutting library services and childcare, attacking the poor, will not help the workers of GM that asked, would not help them at all. Fine, I'll, I'll try and get some job action centers set up after you've lost your jobs, that's what he's saying. And he's totally dismissive of young people, particularly who see climate change as a huge fre a threat that it is. And as people are driven out of their homes in this province, in Quebec, we see it day after day on the TV if you watch it, driven out of their homes by floodwaters, he's happily slashing the conservation authority budgets, which are supposed to monitor this and rebuild dikes and reinforce, because we ha this happened just two, three years ago, and yet he's slashing the budgets of the, of the groups that, uh, the government groups that are supposed to be monitoring and helping. It's an onslaught against programs that have taken generations to win, and he and his well-heeled cronies at Queen's Park actually laugh as they vote to destroy what so many depend on to maintain a semblance of a decent life. If you've seen any of the coverage of what goes on in the legislature, it's totally clear. If you also attended the 10,000 strong health care rally that just took place on Tuesday, it was incredible. A lot of older people who know what it was like before we had public health care in this province, in this country, a lot of paramedics, workers like yourself and others who have work every day in this system, they came out and patients of hospitals, long-term care facilities and others talked about the lack of services, the lack of necessary tests and surgeries, healthcare workers being run off their feet trying to keep up with the jobs that they want to do, that they love to do. And it's a calculated plan to see privatization as the only alternative. Now we know and listening to these two, you feel it in the room that there is a spirit of resistance. We have a history of resistance in this country, like so many countries around the world. It's the 100th anniversary of the Winnipeg General Strike. You who grew up here, I didn't, learned about it, I'm sure, in your history classes, or I hope you did anyway. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But immigrant workers and Canadian-born soldiers returning from World War I took to the streets. They took on the capitalists in that Manitoba city, in that iconic picture of a streetcar turned over on a downtown thoroughfare gives you a sense of what actually was happening because of the class anger that was rising because of the lack of alternatives that ordinary people were facing. And if any of you are going to be here tomorrow, there's going to be a uh, part of a play that one of our comrades, Thomas McKechnie, is doing. It's going to be shown in the next, uh, in May, June, as part of Mayworks, and it's talking about this. He gave a little snippet of it at Labor Council last night, and people loved it. But it's not only 100 years ago. We had the days of action in the 1990s. And when I was at the healthcare worker, I was standing next to a guy who's Hispanic background. He came over because we were steel workers. We were holding our flags. And he said, I'm a steel worker, too. And he said, uh, I brought my son out. He said, I came here when I was about his age, about eight years old, and my parents took me to some of the big rallies at Queen's Park against Harris. And he said, so I want my son to be here just like I was there and inform him of what it means to have to fight for what you require to live a decent life in this country. And this is the spirit that we're seeing in the trade union and the unorganized working class in this country. And I think any people who were not kids, and maybe were there at, a, at the age of eight, remember that incredible feeling of one million workers who stayed home from work. The TTC wasn't running, the schools were shut down, manufacturing plants were shut down. We were coming from a struck plant out on, uh, uh, in, in, in Scarborough, we came down the Don Valley and there was nobody but us at rush hour. Nobody but us. And we got downtown and we were walking onto the stock exchange up University Avenue. No one there but workers and their allies. It was an extraordinary sense of what we mean, that the feeling is there, we have the capacity to do it if we could organize ourselves. And I think today, we're getting little glimpses of that. The students who walk out, and good for the students, we've got a young people right here, I don't know if you're still in high school or you're not, but there you are. The students 
led the way. 100,000 of them walked out. Teachers had the 40,000 rally, the healthcare workers that I was speaking about. And of course, we had the victory earlier of the Fight for 15 that was grabbed from us. And we defeated, if anyone here is a trade unionist remember, a number of years ago when Hudak, who was the head of the Tory party then, he wanted to essentially do away with unions, take away our rights to have unions and to, uh, to be able to defend ourselves and work. And we organized, we rallied, and we won, and he lost. And this shows you that organizing, and particularly the unions, but in the community as well, is the strongest defense we have against the ravages uh, that are gone wild, certainly right now. Now you've heard the resolve of my fellow panelists, and if Megan Whitfield was here, and I've spoken many times with her, postal worker Terry works with her. Terry was the uh, temporary, what, interim chief stop steward at, the, uh, at, at, at South Central. And what CUPW did, you know, when, when, uh, when you were being legislated against, and all kinds of solidarity developed amongst other unions to shut down and blockade the sorting plants. And this happened across the country. And this is the type of spirit that we've got to get back to, which has won us so much and stopped uh, attacks against us in, in, the in the past. And as Michelle was saying, Kristen Wong Tam, a city councilor, not known to be a revolutionary socialist particularly, calling for a strike on May Day because she's so frustrated by what's going on at city at the city because of the attacks of the province and is asking, because she hears every day what her constituents are saying, what they're losing, what's going to happen when my child care center isn't going to be there anymore, or I'm not going to be able to get a subsidy anymore, what's going to happen you know, when public health shuts down and the, 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 uh, the, the, the prenatal, the postnatal uh, services, all the services they do, the sexual health service, what are we going to do? And uh, she called that, and as Michelle said, 2000 came out to Queen's Park and actions were taken. There was an action at my workplace as well, any place where there was a little spark of people wanting to do something. And the fellow workers, I was amazed, you know, people are standing with their fists in the air, and even the doctors where I work, some of them, some of them, not all of them, came in on board. <laughs> and, uh, and that was great. Now, interestingly, Premier Ford got a little upset when he learned or saw that there was a guillotine being set up on the, uh, <laughs> on the grass there. And uh, he said, well, this really is, uh, this is unconscionable. I mean, I mean, this is not a joke. I mean, well, I wonder why. What, what's coming over your mind there? Obviously, it was just a prop. But when people are angry, they show it in the ways that they feel they can show it. And clearly, there were people with an artistic bent there. But also, you have city councillors like Joe Cressy, a young city councillor, NDP background. He's chair of the Board of Health. And when he has been speaking, and I've heard him on a number of occasions, he says people will die. And he's not exaggerating. You know, Ford says, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. This is an exaggeration. But it's in our lived history, the SARS epidemic that hit our city particularly. People died. Patients died, healthcare workers died, and many who didn't were sick and debilitated for a very, very long time. In Ontario, the town of Walkerton, which is about maybe three hours, two and a half hours north, because of the cuts of the last conservative government, the water was not being tasted, tested, and people died. This is the reality. And as they're saying, public health is something you don't really see. It's there. You don't really see it. But when it's not there, suddenly, suddenly, the effects are there again and again and again and again, and people really feel it. And that's why the public health budgets were increased from the province to the cities after Walkerton, after SARS, because they knew they needed to do it to prevent catastrophes like that again. And that's the concrete reality of cuts, the concrete reality. And the problems we're facing, and both my brother and sister here talked about it, is that many of our labor leaders, top of our unions, aren't reading the times. They haven't got their ear to the ground. They're busy talking to each other. They're not listening to the people. Now, the top labor leaders, they're sort of a layer that's unto them own between workers and the employer. And they're often far removed from the workplace and uh, far from the tools, as we tend to say. And, uh, and many have been saying, wait till the next election, we'll vote this guy out. Well, of course we want them defeated in the next election. I mean, that's, 
obvious, but we don't have to wait, and that's what the debate is. We have to build the momentum now, giving people confidence in their ability to stop these attacks. And if things start moving, and this has been my experience, you'll see the labor leaders run to the front, right? Because things are going. Uh-oh, they're going. And then we had a taste of it and what happened with you guys, both of you, and the different stories you said. And that's a phenomenon that's been happening for a long time. Now, it's a one-year anniversary of Ford coming up. And Michelle gave a terrific speech last night at Labor Council about what we got to do. All right, we can't maybe go to a province-wide general strike right off the bat. We know we have to build, but we have to build. And leafleting it occasionally at the TTC about the cuts, or leafleting as I did at the local school in my neighborhood. But you know, I knew everyone there. Hi, Carolyn, how are you? We're the same activist, OK? We need to get beyond that. We need to allow the ordinary person who's feeling it, who's feeling these cuts, to have a role in fighting them. We've got to open up the movement of resistance to allow people to take part in it. And that's what I think our labor leaders are not seeing. And when Michelle said what she said, and when John Cartwright, the president of the Labor Council, said, well, how many people, if we said, all right, have your fellow workers walk out? And it's not even a walkout, it's lunchtime. It's spring, it's summer, practically. Who would do it? Well, all kinds of hands went up, you know? And I think that people are looking for it, and this is what we have to do. We have to create the pressure and give the analysis and give examples of what people can do to really scare. If a guillotine, a fake guillotine scares the guy, come on. If people start walking out of their workplaces and saying what they really feel, and not just the usual activist we anticipate and expects, way beyond that, and I think this can happen. <clears throat> we have to follow the lead of those students, we have to follow the lead of the teachers, and everyone else who has been making those, uh, making those steps forward. Now I wanna say a little bit just about the federal election that's coming up too. God knows what's, what's going to happen there. I mean, you see Kenny being invited, uh, you know, elected in uh, Alberta, you know, and he and uh, at my workplace, people would say, oh my God, did you see uh, Ford and Kenny coming together? They're just like, oh, you know, smiling blissfully at each other. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we have to look at real alternatives. And just like my friend in Paris said about the yellow jackets, you know, these are ordinary people who came to the streets because they had no alternative. They felt they had to move. They wouldn't have done it maybe a year ago or two years ago, but they're doing it because something very real was at stake for them. Now, my own sense, I see the climate strikes, the young people walking out on, on these kind of issues, the, new green, the Green New Deal that Alexandria Ocasio Cortez has turned politics on its head, it seems, in the United States. Well, this Green New Deal, and what it's talking about is putting huge investment into infrastructure to develop good green union jobs and take on the inequities in our society. Who gets the jobs? Take on the question of poverty. It wraps it all up in an interesting package. And not that it's perfect, but I think if you're demanding in a federal election to create a million climate jobs, union jobs that could reduce poverty and the inequities, take the lead of indigenous people so that people don't have to go to the tar sands to support their families. I mean, Megan wasn't here, but the Canadian Union of Postal Workers proposal to refit, refit GM Oshawa to build a, a fleet of electric trucks the Canada Post has the largest truck fleet in the country. Well, why is that such a stupid idea? My God, you want to keep the place open. You want to move toward electrified vehicles. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers, who has its own fights on its hands, is saying, we are happy to work with you on this. GM workers, like you there, are happy to see this happen, and it could potentially keep thousands of people at work and decent jobs. And that then, if it was actually taken seriously and began to be implemented, that could become a model across the world, frankly, because we know we're moving into times, I mean, even the industrialists know it, that electrified vehicles, all that, 
it's the wave of the future. So this is not crazy, radical, Marxist kind of theory. This is something that could actually work. So why doesn't that become part of the federal election? Local 222 voted, and then your labor council did too, to nationalize GM. Why not? Why not? And if we demand the governments respond to the climate crisis, as they have to, the floods just continue, continue. I mean, what if the election was right now, you know? What if it was right now with all those floods in, uh, in Quebec, Ontario, all these people losing their homes, et cetera? If we demand that the governments respond to the climate crisis, build the infrastructure to create jobs outside the fossil fuel sector, the LEAP Manifesto, the Green New Deal are pointing to the answer. Community benefit agreements that we've tried to get going here are also, so in Toronto, where we fight for the jobs in the mass transit and everything that's coming forward, which is a green job, a climate job, go to the communities affected, where racialized youths are given opportunities for good union jobs. And the building trades are onto this. They're willing to do it. They're setting it up. It's only 10% at this moment, but they are providing the apprentices. This is huge. And kids who really had no option for decent jobs in the past are getting options to have a trade, you know? And, ha and this is important. Now we know, I was born in the United States. I learned all about the Green New Deal. Honest God, my family, they were Democrats down there. You know, FDR was the best thing since sliced bread. But if you read a little bit about it, you all, Fred, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a president. The Green New Deal, the, the yeah, in the, in the US, the New Deal in the United States was, took place in the 1930s in the heart of the Depression. And if you look closely, you see, well, there was expro expropriation of indigenous lands. There were racist implementation of the New Deal. And what it did was co-opt, in many ways, the demands of a very large unemployed workers' movement and workers who were still employed who frankly wanted a radical transformation of society because of what the Depression was doing. Now that didn't happen. It co-opted many of the ideas, but these movements sparked a huge infrastructure program that gave jobs to so many, gave confidence to them again, and also sparked a major unionization drive in unorganized sectors at that time, such as steel, rubber, auto, food processing, et cetera. And these also brought so many into organizations, socialist organizations, fighting for a new society, a society they felt they wanted to do away with the exploitation, the oppression. And many, many, many of these were immigrants to the United States. So when we're talking about a Green New Deal, that's what we're talking about. And I think for the federal election, if this becomes something that really is on people's minds and more power to, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because she is turning it upside down. And uh, suddenly, my union, United Steelworkers, has put out a position supporting the Green New Deal with the reservations, but nonetheless. And the reason is they are being pushed. They're being pushed because people want what it's promising. They want decent jobs again. They want to rid their communities of poverty. They want everyone, no matter the race, creed, color, sexuality, gender, to have the ability to have a decent job. And that's what's drawing people to this, and that's why people can't ignore it. So me, I think, let's think about it, you know? Let's think about it for the federal election. But now that's not till the fall. So we still got the big fight that's going on right now. And I think in this province, and I know some of you aren't from this province, but can't help but talk about it. This is a critical moment, a critical moment. Because Ford is not invincible. He is not invulnerable. He likes to make you think he is, but he is not. And we have seen that government at Queens Park take a step back when farmers and indigenous people fought against allowing the development or the developers to go into the green belt that surrounds the city of Toronto. Now, Merv King was going to be here this evening. Some of you know Merv. He's a steel worker and indigenous activist from originally Timiskaming First Nations. And he was going to open this session tonight, but he forgot that he was actually going to Cuba on vacation, <laughs> well-deserved vacation. His wife said, oh, Merv, you can't do that. Why? Because 
We're going to Cuba. Oh, of course. All right. But he wanted to bring his solidarity absolutely to this meeting tonight. And the fact that he talking to not only the farmers, but all kinds of people up in Aurora, New York, and all those areas, and the indigenous people who were just north of it, they fought together and they put tremendous pressure on Ford and he had to back down, even though his developer friends were saying, oh, keep strong, keep strong, we need this, it'll be billions and billions for us. He had to back down. The Tories did the same back down when the parents of the autistic children started demonstrating outside Queen's Park, they had press conferences, and these were the ordinary middle class, as some call them, working class people who said, we need help, and we're not getting it. And frankly, this is an absolute disgrace what you are doing to us and our children. You are denying them any future in this province. He backed off. And this is important. If you ever read The Art of War, you know, this is important. He is vulnerable, he will back off, and we have to be very strategic. And now, he's also feeling the, hell, the, the heat on the public health offering. He's offered transitional funding, and this is very interesting. I'll finish soon if you're trying to tell me. Uh, he's offered, well, I'll give transitional funding so that it won't be so bad, because you know what he did in terms of public health, and I know this very well because it affects where I work. It's retroactive to right now, to April 1st. I mean, they've already set their budgets. We are, I mean, it's madness. Contracts have already been signed. I mean, union people are doing, you know. He's, okay, okay, I see that. We'll offer you transitional funding to get you through this first year. And you know what the Boards of Health have said? Forget about it. No, we don't want it. We're not going to accept it. Now, hopefully they stay strong. But this is the Boards of Health across the province of Ontario, not just the city. But across the province of Ontario, mayors of a, every major city in this province have written to him saying, stop. The chair of every board of health, every medical officer of health has said the same. This is a very broad thing. There's a meeting taking place on it. I got a, uh, a message from my city councilor that there's a meeting Tuesday night that I should go to there. Tory's going to be there, and uh, Joe Cressy's going to be there. Medical Officer of Health is there. They're trying to build these town hall meetings all over the city on this issue. So they're feeling the heat. They're feeling the heat, and this is what I think has given hope to hundreds of thousands of people, just like ourselves, across this province who feel we can organize against these attacks by an uncaring government, which is absolutely hell-bent on doing away with our social safety net, labor protections we have, ignoring the threat of climate change and all else that I've said. So there's a tremendous anger at the base of society as more and more of these cuts roll out. And the labor movement cannot go on business as usual. People from communities across the province are crying out for a broad and sustained movement of resistance. The stewards' assemblies that took place, we had 900 people here from every union going, a lot from the building trades, a lot from the teachers. These were very important steps. As I mentioned, the 40,000 teachers and the others, the kids, students, I shouldn't call them kids, who walked out, these are hugely, hugely important. Union leaders, local and provincial, have to hear the clamoring for a real fight the back that people are demanding. And I believe the mood in Ontario has changed dramatically since the election has changed dramatically since six months ago. More and more are disillusioned with this government, the trade unions working with diverse allies from every community have to do the work of mobilizing the sentiment is there. Organize, educate, resist was the clarion call when we fought Harris and had all those strikes. And this is exactly what has to be done today because I do believe that Ford can be beaten. We've seen it in other areas and we have to be in the heart of that struggle. And as we fight for this, and I think one of the most important lessons that we've learned in looking at labor history anywhere is the critical role of working people in all the diversity that we see in this city. I'll be there. We have to be at the heart of this struggle. 
We have to make it clear that people like ourselves have the power to seize control of the ways of creating wealth and subordinate them to our decisions, our values. We don't have to leave it to the blind caprice of the market, the mad rush of rival owners of wealth as you see them salivating as they're going to bring back the Ontario Municipal Board to overturn cities around developing development uh, issues. And we cannot accept the insane logic of the market that Ford wants us to. Competitive accumulation, all of that stuff. Working harder and harder for less. Living in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We are saying no to that. And I think we have to be there. We have to do all that we can in every workplace. And as we fight, we have to be clear. We want to fight against the exploitative practices of Ford government, our employers like GM Oshawa, and at the same time, we have to fight against the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the ableism, the oppression in all its manifestations that we face every day of our lives. So we have to continue the fight today, and I think what we're asking all of you here, join together wherever you may be, your workplace, your community, your school, Join us in that struggle, and if we can build that collective response, we can beat him, we can win, and we can bring the province back to the control of the people who deserve the dignity and respect in this province. Thank you very much.